Matthew chapter 25, we're going to be with verse 31. We're going to finish up today. I know that's a bold statement by me, but we're going to finish up uh, the teachings of Jesus concerning the last days. All right, so. And, and he's taking us through into with some parables and with some just straight out teaching um, of the certain things that are going to happen. So we've looked at and talked about different prophecies that were being fulfilled. Um, we've talked about and it went through parables and, and what God expects, what Jesus expects of those who are following him. Last week we looked at the the parable of, of the talents. We looked at the faithful servants and the unfaithful servant and his demise the one who thought that he had or well and and was made available to him something very valuable but rather than use it and put it to work he buried it and hid it until the master came back and when he comes back he is he is sent to judgment he's not he's not allowed to enter into the rest he's not allowed to continue on even as a master but he says cast that the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that has been a theme that's going to be again today. We'll see both the, the ones who have responded to the Lord and their reward, and we're going to see those who have rejected the Lord and their judgment, which is not a very popular thing to talk about these days, but in fact, fewer and fewer, most will just avoid it, Others will flat out say this is not what it means. And you know from the Sundays and, and, and even Wednesday nights, but also the, the last couple of weeks of doing the Monday and Tuesday nights and on top of that, that you can't throw away part of God's word. You can't do it. You can't just allegorize whatever you want to allegorize and, and take literally whatever you want to take literally. If it's, if it, is something that can be symbolic, then yes, we can look at it symbolically. But it's going to line up with everything that is literal. You, you don't take certain uh, types of Christ or, or pictures of Christ and say that this makes it different. And we can look at this person differently or we can look at this story differently without overlaying the rest of Scripture with it and make it just whatever we, we want, want it to mean. All right, we can't do that. We do that, we compromise God's word, we compromise our relationship with God as far as I'm concerned. If we're willing to do that, we are not willing then to know who God is. We're trying to make him into an image that we want rather than the image of who he really is and what scripture says he is. So we have to be very careful, one, to make sure that we're not doing that. And... We need to also, in my heart, in my mind, uh, I believe we have to reject those who are willing to do that. And it's very obvious from what we're going to look at today that, that Jesus does. He rejects those who are, who, and, and from what we looked at last week, he rejects those who won't, who won't teach the word, won't expound on his word, won't talk about or, or, or live out for others to see will not make any investment with what he's given us into the lives of others so that it might multiply rather just hide it within themselves or just minimize it somehow so that it's it becomes ineffective and it's unfortunate because there are many people who have done that and and now what they've done is they've taken what was made to change people's lives and they've made it of no effect so that their own words can mean more than what God's word says. And you don't have to look very far. We're not going to get into all of that. I've, I've, well, I'm not saying I'll never do it again, but we've, we've, uh, beaten up on the, those who can be defined as false teachers and, and without, you don't even have to name names guys. If you read God's word, you can see the compromise in the teaching of, of most people. You can, you can forgot to give my wife the keys. There you go. Anyways, you <laughs> nah. 
no keys for her. Anyhow, so this this section here from verse 31 to verse 46, let's get me back on track. I probably was a needed interruption. I'm, I was on a rabbit trail I couldn't get off of anyhow. So um, uh, this section, I believe, in, in, in – there's some debate about when this event is going to take place. Will it take place right after the tribulation time prior to the millennial kingdom? Or is this going to be a description of the great white throne judgment? It doesn't seem so. It seems that this is to me anyways, I believe this is prior to the millennial kingdom. So after the tribulation time prior to, to est establishing of that thousand year uh, reign of Christ on the earth, this this event right here is going to take place. We're looking at three different groups of people. In a, in a broad sense, we're looking at two different groups of people. In verse 32, he says, all the nations will be gathered together before him. And as you get farther into it, he talks about his brethren. So that I believe that that is Israel specific, just Israel. Not, not anybody else, not tribulation saints. This is Israel. All right. I think actually the ones that he's addressing within the nations, and we'll, when we get into this, you're going to see he splits them into sheep and into goats. And the one on his right, the sheep on his right hand, those are the believers. The goats on his left hand are, are the unrighteous. And, and so that's, that's the division. So that's how you end up with three different groups of people here. You have those who have lived through the tribulation time, who are believers, who are the righteous, and you have those who... Uh, who lived through the tribulation time, but still were unrighteous, still the ones that we see in Revelation that blaspheme God, even when they know and they understand that the plagues that are falling the earth, coming on the earth are the wrath of God from the throne room of God, and yet they still reject him. They still blaspheme against him. So that's your sheep and your goats. And when he says, my brethren, he's talking specifically about the Jews that have survived that time period too. All right, so let's start reading. Verse 31 says, the son of man comes in his, or when the son of man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on his, on the throne of his, of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them out one from another as shepherd or as a shepherd divides his, his sheep from the goats and he will set the sheep on his right hand, uh, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from, before, or from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, uh, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to the... Uh, as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to, to those uh, on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in naked and you did not clothe me sick and in prison. You did not visit me. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer uh, them saying, assuredly, I say to you, in as much as you did not do it uh, to one of the least of these, you did not do it uh, to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, that, that seems pretty dramatic. It seems very final to me. It doesn't just seem final. It is final. Um, this is a time when he comes back. We look in Revelation uh, chapter 20. You see the description of that time when he comes back with his saints. In fact, in Joel, 
or I'm sorry, in Zechariah, I think it's, it says that he's going to come back with his saints too. So here he says he comes back with all of the angels with him. So you take all of the angels, you go to Zechariah, and you see all of the saints coming with him too. This is all of heaven empties out to come with God, come back with Jesus. The angels, those who have, who have been taken in the rapture, I believe those who, who have been uh, persecuted to death, have lost their life during the tribulation time, they all come back with him. This is, this is quite a show of force. If you've watched any of the, and I, I'm not sure that this doesn't still happen in some of the communist countries, but if you watch some of the, the old film clips from uh, World War II, and you see the great parades that would go through towns with tanks and, and guns and cannons and, and just thousands upon thousands of soldiers that would come with a show of force to intimidate the enemy. That's why you do this. You come looking like you're ready for battle. And even today, we would say that some of the things that we do, uh, just thinking about even Desert Storm, when, when I was in the Air Force, and I remember the day the attack started. And we looked at that as a great show of force. People were like, well, wasn't that a little over, overkill to just all night long, you just assault and assault and assault and assault, and it didn't stop. Yeah, that, that was that was the point, because when you overwhelm the enemy, you get them to be intimidated and give up. You get them to surrender. And that was the point. And that is the point even today when you see certain things happen. When when Israel has 100 rockets launched at them and they launch a thousand more back and destroy everything. That's a show of force. You know, when we have. And, and honestly, guys, our 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 uh, Memorial Day parades and our and our our Fourth uh, of July events. Those aren't just meant to be celebrations. Those parades start as a remembrance often for, for the men and women who have gone before, who have given their lives, and so it is a memorial. But at the same time, when the country will come out and, and make that display of honor toward those who have given their life, that's a show of force. That shows the rest of the world that our nation backs our military, that they have our support. When, when, a, when an enemy can look at a nation who will respond to a call to give honor to the fighting men and women of that nation, that's a show of force. It, it shows them that are still going off and fighting the battles that they have people behind them, backing them up. When Jesus comes back, this is going to be a huge show of force. This is going to be a physical representation, or spiritual, I guess. I don't know how you want to look at it, but it'll be a visible re re representation of the power of God, of the power of Jesus and his work on the cross, and what it did to conquer the kingdom of darkness, what it did to conquer the devil. That work, how complete it was on the cross. It is going to be, now we're not going to have to do anything. But show up. I think we'll probably be in some kind of rank and file. We'll, we'll be there. But the greatest thing is going to be, I mean, if you read what Zechariah, let me go there real quick when he comes back. This chapter 14 de describes uh, the day of the Lord. It says, behold, the day of the Lord is coming and your spoil will be uh, divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those, uh, against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be uh, split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. 
half of the mountain shall be moved toward the north and half of it toward the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain uh, through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach Aziel. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. And you read through the rest of the chapter and it describes that day and what it'll be like. Um, Joel talks about, about that day. Uh, chapter 3, verse 14, he, he says, The multitudes, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And it goes on to, to describe again some more of the day of the Lord and, and some of the signs that we've already looked at. Um, but he's coming back to do war. We talk often, and I've talked often about he's coming back to judge, but he's also coming back for war first. That battle in Armageddon, when all of the nations, as Joel said, will be gathered together there to do war. And in Zechariah, we see that they'll actually overcome Jerusalem. But when they move out into the valley and Jesus comes back and he touches down on the Mount of Olives, it's going to split in two. And they've actually denied building permits for hotels on the Mount of Olives because seismology technology we have now shows there's a huge fault line right through that mountain. So that when he touches down, it's ready to split already. We, we know it could, it, a giant earthquake could snap that thing open and, and, and cause it to, to come apart. But we already know the Bible tells us what's going to actually cause it. It'll be him coming down onto the mountain with all of the saints and all of the angels coming with him. And it says there the nations will be gathered before him. So I think after the, after the battle is over, Armageddon's done. He's getting ready to set up. He's going through the motions of setting up his kingdom. In fact, I believe when we went through Revelation, we saw there's like a 75-day pause or blank spot there that we can't account for after the seven years are done and the tribulation time starts. When we just read straight through, there's, there's, it, it looks like one thing's just bang, bang, bang right after another. But it seems he takes his time and he's setting up his kingdom. He's establishing what's going to happen. He's putting people in their places of, of leadership and, and whatever else is going to be going on during that time. But then he says, all the nations will be gathered uh, before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep for the goats. That's not this nation over here, this nation over here. This is the righteous from the unrighteous. So all the nations of the world will be here. And we saw that his angels will gather together him to, to him his elect. So all the, all the Jews, I believe, that are all over the world, the angels go bring them back. They're there. All who are left, the ones that have been hiding in Petra, any of the others that have been hiding throughout the rest of the world. And from this section right here, it seems like not everybody runs to Petra, just those who are in Israel. The others are going to have to hide where they're at. Now, I've heard a lot of, a lot of sermons <clears throat> preached on this section, and, and it's presented as though all of us, right now in our day and time, if we don't do these things under the least of these, my brethren, then we fall into judgment. And we, and we talk often about doing good to the least. And while it's, it's a right principle... The literal interpretation of this passage of scripture has to do with the tribulation time. And it has to do with how the rest of the world reacts toward Israel. We have a great example of this in, in World War II when, when the persecution went out to, uh, to the Jews in, in, in Germany and in other places. But we'll just stick specifically to Germany. And we have stories of Christians who hid the Jews in their houses. They built false walls in their homes. 
or they hid him in certain pl- in the attic or whatever they did to hide and to care for and take care of the Jewish uh, uh, people, to hide them from Hitler. It's going to be similar to that, probably worse, in that tribulation time. So the nations are gathered before Jesus now at this particular judgment. They're separated out, the righteous from the unrighteous. And he will set the sheep, verse 33, on his right hand, but the goats on his le- on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, uh, you, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. Now, Again, this is, this should be a great comfort to us that, I mean, we have it written here that this is what's going to happen, but to know that this was prepared from the foundations of the world. That he knew before he put man in the garden, before he breathed life into Adam, he knew Adam was going to mess it up. And he knew that every man after him was going to mess it up. And he, so he, he made the way of salvation. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, I'm sorry, yeah, I think that's where, yes, it says, just as he has chosen us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should uh, be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us acceptable in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him we have uh, obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That we who first uh, trusted in, in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having been having believed you were sealed with the holy spirit of promise who is a gar- the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory now <clears throat> that that's to the church that assurance that you were purchased and, and and set apart from the foundations of the world but there are also those in this time period, it was determined for them to come to Christ in the tribulation time. But the fact remains is that when the Bible tells us we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, we can believe it because we see here that he set it in order at the foundations of the world, before the foundations of the world. That he already knew us then. That he had us in mind. That Jesus on the cross had you and me in mind personally. Not, not just as a, 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 a blanket redemption for all of mankind. But an individual redemption. He paid the price for you specifically. For me specifically. For the world as a whole, for every single person on the, on the face of the planet, he has paid the price for them. Each one individually. And he stands willing to give it to whoever will receive it. In this particular case, though, in Matthew, he's talking to those who, who have lived again through the tribulation time. 
and there is an inheritance for them to enter into the kingdom prepared for the foundations of, or from the foundations of the world. It would seem to me from this particular passage of scripture that everyone who enters into that thousand year reign is a believer. There won't be one unrighteous person that enters in. We read again in Revelation chapter 20 that it will be set up for a thousand years and during that time Satan will be locked in the bottomless pit. He's going to be in, an, in the abyss. He, he will not be loose during that thousand years to interfere with anything or inspire anybody. However, when he is released, we find that he's able to rally a rebellion against Jesus. Which just goes to speak of the wickedness of men's hearts. And that it's in us. It's, it may be inspired by Satan. It may be inspired by the devil at times to come out. Or how we might play it out. We see that in the garden. When he interacts with Eve. It'll be in us. And even with Jesus standing on the earth. Reigning for a thousand years. You already know what will be whispered in people's ears. Did he really say this? Did he real is this really what he meant when he said this? And the answer is going to be yes. That's the, for the righteous, the answer will be yes even at the end of the 1000 year reign. But for those who are going to take up that rebellion that will be crushed by him, the answer is going to be the same as Eve. Uh, I don't know. Maybe not. It's what I've been told. But maybe you're right. And somehow the lies will be the same. The inspiration will be the same. It always is. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those three things, we typically fall in all three aspects of it, but it only takes a failure in one. But because you see something and you have this great desire in your heart to grab a hold of it and to use it for your for your own your own good, you you we all on a daily basis have to fight against that. To become selfish and prideful. That that's what that's what sin is. I mean, that's, I'm sorry, that's what, that's what pride is. It is the sin of self. It is me above everything else. Even knowing the judgment of God is coming, it's still, you know what? I, I can't live without that. That's what Adam's sin was. He knew the judgment. God said, if you, the day you eat from this tree, you're going to die. Satan says, you're not going to die. The day you eat from that tree, you're going to be just like God. That's what he doesn't want you to be. And convinced her that she wasn't already like God. So we created in his image. She was created in, in, in his image. Adam was created in the image of God. They're never going to be God, but how much more like God do you need to be? And Satan has convinced us that there's more to this than what he's telling us. He's convinced us through all kinds of false religions that, that have been established in the hearts of men that we can be like God, we will assimilate into God, we will be a part of him, we are gods, we'll have our own planet someday, whatever. All kinds of different weirdness. And even from those within the church that you can, like God, speak things into existence. Those things that were not as though they were. You say those things, you have the ability through your words to create just like God. And some of them are even bold enough to, to say we're, we are all gods. And they'll, they'll pay for that. If they don't find forgiveness before he comes, they'll pay for that with an eternity of suffering. 
where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, if we take away the judgment of God, we minimize God. Those guys that are out there that are saying there's no hell or there's no eternity in hell, they're all minimizing God's word. At the very least, if not taking away. They are playing and saying the, the lies that Satan per, portrayed. It, that's not really what he said. That's not really what he meant. That is the, the lies of Satan coming out of their mouth. That is what Paul calls the doctrine of demons. When somebody stands in a pulpit or in a Sunday school class or even on the street trying to witness to somebody or, or whatever program you have to try to fill your church full of, of people, when it takes the word of God and it minimizes it and it brings doubt into it or it says you don't have to believe this part or you don't really have to believe that part, he didn't really mean this. Or that science has... has enlightened us to God's word because that's where they're going with it now. You have pastors saying that evolution is undeniable. Those are the doctrines of demons coming out of their mouth. That is demonically inspired. I like the responses. That, I mean, look, well, let's look at the responses to these two groups. First, Jesus says to the first one, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me, gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say, and say to them, As surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it uh, to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And then he's going to say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you curse and uh, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. See that? There's another point right there you might want to point out to people who don't believe in hell or when you're trying to tell somebody about hell and they don't like that God's going to judge for eternity. It wasn't prepared for us. That was prepared for the devil and his angels. But if you insist on following their doctrines rather than the doctrines of the Bible, well, then... You're just, you've already decided to go with them. Anyways, 42, he says, and I was hungry and you, you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not uh, take me in naked and you did not clothe me sick and in prison. You did not visit me. And they will also, and they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Do you see the difference in the responses? First of all, the charges are different, obviously. One is very positive charge. Well, actually, they're actually both positive as far as Jesus said, this is what happened. But one is a charge of righteousness. You did these things. And he goes through a list and this is your, this is what happened. And this is your response to it. And to the, to the unrighteous, he says, this is what happened. And this was your response to it. It was a negative response. You didn't act. You didn't act on it. You see those who are, who are the righteous in that time period are going to put their lives in danger ministering to those of Israel, hiding them, protecting them, to the extent of saying, I will stand with Israel now and not take the mark. Because if you don't take the mark, you die. You are, you are, a, <laughs> you are a marked person by not having a mark. 
You're an unmarked person. Listen, that's why I, I believe it, it won't just be a technology-type based thing. There's going to be a visible mark. But the responses hit me when I was preparing for this. The righteous go through the list in detail. When did we, when did we see you a, a stranger and take you in? Or when, when did we see you hungry and feed you or, or thirsty and, and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? And they're going through it specifically. When did we see you in this state and do this for you? They're paying attention to his words. And repeating his words are important to them. But the unrighteous, their response is blanket statement, broad-based statements. A broad response that is not detailed at all. Look at then they will also uh, then they will answer him, also answer him, I'm sorry, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and did not minister to you? Responding to him the way the righteous did is not important to them. Not even standing in front of him. When did we see you in all these different ways? We'll just run down the list. When did we see you hungry and, and, and naked and thirsty and a stranger? And when did we do that? The righteous went by item by item. When did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you a drink? And they're marveling that when did I do this? I, I don't I don't remember doing this to you. And the other ones seem to want to just minimize the whole thing. Lord, really, how can you hold me accountable? I didn't know you were there. How did I know when did I ever see you hungry? When did I ever see you thirsty? When did I, and they just run down the list. It seems to me the righteous are really trying to think of instances. When did I give you a glass of water? When did I give you some clothes? The unrighteous are just like, when did we see any of this and minister to you? Now, Jesus doesn't make a big deal out of that, so maybe I shouldn't make as big a deal out of it as I am, but it just kind of strikes me. One group is paying attention to the words that come from Jesus' mouth. The other ones, I'm just going to minimize it. Let's just get this over. Let's just get this argument done. You can't hold me accountable for these things, and I didn't take care of you. And he says, as, oft, or as much as you, uh, assuredly I say to you, in as much as you did not do it to the least of these my brethren, you did not do it to me. And it's going to be not as though they didn't have opportunity. They had opportunity to do it. You, they're going to make a decision one way or the other. Are you going to stand with Israel? Are you going to stand with the people of, of God? Especially after that three and a half year mark. Because that's when, when the Antichrist is going to have his, his uh, figure or idol of himself put into the temple. And the false prophet is going to demand that everybody worship him. And when he's rejected by Israel, when their eyes are opened up and say, well, wrong, we've been wrong for three and a half years, you're not the Messiah. And they flee to go be protected. And he tries to get at them where they're at, especially the main group from Israel proper that makes it to Petra when he tries to get at them and he's not allowed to, to harm them. 
It says there that he'll turn on the saints. And he will overcome the saints. And he will kill many, many. And he says to these, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Everlasting punishment right here, right now. And this isn't even the great white throne judgment. At that point, he sets up the kingdom. They reign for a thousand years. They have the final rebellion. He crushes that. And then you, you see after that, in 20 and 21, the description of, of, of the change. The great white throne judgment. When the books are open and and go through the books and see all the works that you've done and and uh, see if it was enough for you to be saved, which is not going to be, because the final book's going to be open and it's going to be, uh, is your name in this book, the Lamb's Book of Life, because if it's not found in there, this other book doesn't really matter. Is done. You, you don't get to come in. Now, some might look at this and say, well, see, it's, it, you do have to work. You have to be about the work of the Lord. You have, and certainly we need to be. But it's not the root of our salvation. We're not saved by works. So let's not think that these righteous were saved by works. What they did was the fruit of their righteousness. Not the, as John MacArthur says, it, it was the fruit of their righteousness, not the root of their righteousness. They're not righteous because of the works they did. They're righteous, or they did the works they did because they were righteous. And it was evident. And even evident to those that they were living among during that time because they're persecuted and, and often to death in that time period. In that seven-year tribulation time, especially the last three and a half years. The acts of the righteous are going to be evident to all those who are unrighteous because they're the ones that are going to be perse persecuting them for the Antichrist. Now for us, we know. In Ephesians chapter 2, we see, starting with verse 1, it says, and, and he made alive, or he and you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the courses of, of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when he, we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we like to stop there. By grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourself is a gift of God, not of works. Right? Grace is a gift. That's what grace is. It means basically unmerited favor. So your forgiveness is a free gift of God. You didn't earn it. So that you can't stand in front of him and boast about it. Look at all that I did to get my forgiveness. But we need to go beyond verse 9, not of works lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship. We are his artwork. It's, it's poema. 
Where do we get poem from? We, we are his poem. Created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Is it important for us to do things? Is it important for us to live out the righteousness that's been given to us? To live out the salvation that's been given to us? Absolutely. And I'm going to say fearlessly, just like those in the tribulation time will have to do. That, that we need to walk in the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ in spite of the dangers, perceived or real. In spite of it all. James tells us, In chapter 2, verse 14, it says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or a sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed, and be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, uh, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works, so show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well, even the demons believe and tremble. But you do, uh, but, but do you want to know O oh, foolish man, that faith without works is dead. And he goes on to explain a little more through the rest of the chapter, but I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, yeah, I believe in the Lord. But there's no evidence of work. And I don't mean the works necessarily. I mean, it, this, is, this is a part of it, the caring for one another, like we see in Matthew chapter 5 toward Israel. But there's no evidence of the work of God in that person that they should walk in them. There's no evidence of a changed life, and they don't think they need to have one. They don't want to change their life. They just want to change their destination. But they want to go their own way. They want to do it in their own accord. There's no change in their life. And that's why James can say faith without works is dead. I used to think when I read that, that, you know, you had to go and you had to feed the homeless. You had to go down to the soup kitchen and volunteer. You had to gather clothes. You had to gather food. You had to do all these things. You have to go out with a band and, and play. You have to do all of these things for your faith to be alive. And the reality of it is, and what James is saying is you do these things because your faith is alive. Number one, but number two, if you go out and do all of these things and there is no change in you, 1 Corinthians 13 says it doesn't matter. It counts for nothing. You can do the dirtiest job in the church to the greatest, whatever you think is the greatest job in the church. You can be there every time the doors are open. You can be at every single event. You can work your fingers to the bone. If there is no change inside of you, if your heart has not been changed by the grace of God, your faith is dead. You've not been made alive in Christ because you have not committed to him. And what we see in this is the result. It will be that way in the end, in that seven-year period of time there. But it's going to be that way now. It is that way now. If you die without a life change, you, you have no evidence of the work of God in your life. If you believe that you don't have to change, 
that you don't have to embrace a new life. You can just keep living on in the old life. If you believe that, you're still lost. You're not paying attention to the details of God's word. You say, well, those things just sound so judgmental. But they're there because he loved you enough to spell it out for you. To spell it out for all of us. He'll even say, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. And right away we think of a big, long list of things, don't we? But that's not true. The, the commandments that he addresses in Matthew in particular are love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And you can't truly do the second one if you don't truly have the relationship to begin with with the first one. If you do not have a real relationship with God Almighty, you cannot truly love your neighbor as you do yourself. Outwardly, you may look fine. But to reject Jesus means inwardly, there's no change. And if we reject portions of his word, how do we change? If we pick and choose what we like and discard what we don't, what evidence of change is there? If we're not willing to brace the, embrace the things that are hard because those are the things that are going to change our life. Those are the things that are going to change us on the inside. When God says, don't do this, or when he says, this person and this person, those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we see ourselves on that list and we're like, no, we cut that one out. That's too judgmental. I don't see God as a God of wrath. He's a loving God. He'll let everybody in. When it says those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, that means those who have made a decision in spite of the instruction of God they have made a decision to walk contrary to God. There's no mistake in that. And by walk, I mean live their life out, walking contrary to God's word. We're not talking about I let my guard down for a little bit and then here I am and I find myself in this spot and I need to come home like a prodigal and run back to the father and say, forgive me. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, you know what? I went through the motions. I prayed a prayer. I got wet in the tub and, and now I'm good. I got baptized. I'm going to heaven. That's just a work. I prayed a prayer. Cried and everything. Okay, so you had an emotional moment because you realized what you are. But what are you doing? Uh, did you really decide in that moment? You may have even decided in that moment, I do need Jesus. I need forgiveness. You know how many people get up and walk away from that? And they get outside the door. And just like a guy getting out of jail, go back to their old place and their old friends and their old, and they go back to their old life. And they say, well, I had a moment. I gave, I gave my heart to the Lord. But what? Well, he didn't take this from me, so he must be okay with it. Nope. Not what the Bible says. It says, give it up. Lay it down. Listen, I could, I could go through all the examples that, that they throw out about the, the woman at the well or the woman caught in adultery and, and, and Jesus didn't condemn him and Jesus didn't stone him. No, but he told him to go and sin no more. Leave it set right here. When you get up and walk away, I've given you an opportunity to be a changed person. Walk away from it. And you're going to battle it. Some things you're going to battle the rest of your life. Some things you'd be completely set free of, and, and you, 50 years from now, you'd be able to say, you know what? I'm free. I've never had a desire for it again. I've never went back to it again. Never gave it a second thought. 
But if you're honest, you're going to say, but man, this other thing that I've got dogging me the rest of my life, these past 50 years, this other thing I have to keep shaking off and giving it back to the Lord. I have to keep crying out to the Lord. I have to keep, yeah, that's what it's for. Actually, that's why he left it there. It doesn't have any more rain on your on your eternity. You're forgiven. But you, we, we all have that reminder. And it, and it can change, but the root of it is still the, the same. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life. You know what your weaknesses are. They may play out differently from day to day or from year to year or whatever. But it's the same weakness that we all have. We all love ourselves. That's why a husband's told to, to, to love his wife as he loves himself. To care for her the way he cares for himself. Because Paul knew we're all selfish. So if your idea is me first, then your idea needs to change and be her first. That, that's the evidence of the change. It's not me first anymore. It's her first. It's, it's them first. It's this person over here first ahead of me. It's get away from self and in, into Jesus so that he can minister to other people through you. It's trust him enough with your own life and your own care, your own health, your own well-being enough that you're willing to reach out to people you wouldn't normally reach out to. That you're willing to speak his word when it needs to be spoken. It's have a real relationship with him and that means you know his word. You're in his word. You want to know what God has for your life? Be in here. Be in the Bible the entirety of it. Don't disregard him. Because we have seen in the last couple of parables here, in the last couple of stories, the end of those who reject God. The end of those who reject his word. It is weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is everlasting, mean, never-ending punishment. but to the righteous eternal life an inheritance a reward and we're just going to go through here to verse 5 and 26 it says now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, you know that after two days is the Passover and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people assembled at the, at the, play, or at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to kill Jesus by trickery and kill him. Or, I'm sorry, plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproaring or uproar among the people. Not during the feast. We don't want to do it during the feast. But when did they do it? Satan has been trying to disrupt God's plan from the very beginning. It was determined that on that Passover, Jesus would be cruci crucified, sacrificed like the Passover lamb. To take away the sins of the world, John the Baptist would tell us. And even though they plotted, and in their plot and in their plan, they said, not during the feast. We don't want an uproaring of the people. Basically, God's response to that is, you're not in control. I am. And they couldn't help themselves. They did what was determined by God to have happen. I wanted to get that little bit out just in the 26, and maybe we'll, we'll probably look at that a little more next week too, but just that to say, don't look at the previous passage as just a story and just an allegory. He is the one in control. He means what he says. Follow him with your whole heart. Embrace the love of the Savior and let him work it out through you. 
And when he says, the unrighteous will go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life, bank on it. Because right there, he made it, he, he exposed the plan, or he revealed the plan of the Father. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be offered up, and I'm going to be delivered to be crucified out of the Passover. And they said, well, we're not going to do it on the Passover. And they did it anyways. He's the one in control of all things. His plan will come to fruition. It will literally come to pass. So how do you avoid the everlasting punishment and receive the eternal life? Well, you said in John chapter 3, you must be born again. So how does that happen? Well, Romans chapter 10 says that if you will confess Jesus as Lord with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. With the assurance that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. But listen, don't just go through the motions because then it's just a work. You have to, have to believe in your heart. You have to let him change you from the inside out, not from the outside, not just on the outside. From the inside out, you have to be changed. Sin begins in the heart and is played out. Righteousness also begins, true righteousness begins in the heart and is played out. So if you have not ever, today is the day. Don't wait. The Bible tells us today is the day of salvation. If you have never ever given your heart to the Lord, today is the day. If you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins and receive you into his kingdom, today is the day. Maybe you haven't been walking with the Lord very closely. Maybe you are that prodigal that is just living in the ways of the world. You've walked away from your father. You think you've spent your inheritance. Come back. Come back. And you don't even have to come all the way back. You turn around, you start walking toward the father. He's going to run to you. You just be determined to get to him. When you get that determination in your heart to get back with the Lord, he's going to come back to you. He's going to come. That's what repentance is. Turn around, walk away from the sin, walk toward Jesus. You do that. He'll run to you. He'll clean you up. He'll clothe you. He'll celebrate you. All of heaven will celebrate you, whether it's the first time or whether you are coming back. Heaven breaks out in celebration. Don't wait. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you again for your word and for these, these stories, these parables, these instructions that you've given us. Letting us know to follow you with our whole heart, Lord, that we, if we will embrace you, then you will, you will embrace and carry us. Lord, if we, will, if we will seek you, you say that we will find you. Lord, for all of those who are looking for a way, I pray today that their eyes will be open to the only way, and that is you. by grace Lord through faith that they would believe and receive that favor from you that they do not have but that you stand ready to give Lord they would receive your mercy and forgiveness that they would know in their heart that they are are no longer heading for judgment but that they are heading for eternal life with you in glory. Lord, I pray for all of us day to day as we fight these battles, as we resist the lies of the enemy 
and are the desires of our own bodies and our own minds. Give us strength, Lord, in these days. In Jesus' name, amen.